What's up guys, coming at you from Shenzhen, and I have a really good one for you today. It, uh, it's a story of irony, hypocrisy, um, and it's in the most uh, spectacular way possible. This video is going to involve uh, ASPI. Some people call it ASPI, I, I, I've gotten used to calling it ASPI already, but whatever, it's Australian Strategic Policy Institute. And I've spoken about them before a few times in my channel, but I found something this morning um, that was really interesting and I'll get to a little bit later on in my video. So first I'll quickly mention that ASPI is an organization that receives funding from the military industrial complex in America while pushing the China threat story and convincing governments to buy their sponsors weapons while pushing that China threat story. <laughs> no interest, no conflict of interest here folks, nothing to see here, just continue on. But um, I think uh, it, this really drives home uh, why I came up with a, a, a name for them, which I, I, re I quite like. I came up with a name for them a while ago. I'm hoping people start using it more. Um, because these people, they enjoy calling anybody who criticizes their anti-China propaganda tankies while working for a think tank with donors who actually manufacture tanks and while actually selling military equipment. So I thought it was only appropriate that we started referring to these guys as think tankies. Um, it's a, it's a, a great way to throw it back in their court and it's, it's way more accurate than the insult that they're using towards folks like us who say, hang on a second, uh, what you're saying here doesn't sound right. So there are actually a, a few really interesting, very animated think tankies that work at ASPI. And Vicky Shu is one of them. She uh, tried to become a comedian, but ended up finally settling on becoming a human rights activist instead. <laughs> so, I, I, sorry, I, I'm already, it's too, um, I, it's too funny, but at this point, I'm seriously convinced, though, that based on how spectacularly ridiculous her content is, you should see some of the stuff she writes, that she's, she's actually just doing a, a massive reconnaissance mission for an epic comedy movie about how a failed comedian could become a military industrial complex backed activist who can fool mass media and manipulate the public with the most moronic claims that she could possibly think of. I mean, if that's the case, if my theory is correct, hats off to Vic, Vicky Shu because it's legitimately hilarious. Um, I, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to come up with something like that uh, no matter how hard I tried. But um, there, there, there's so much that I can actually share and show you um, about her work. Uh, even thinking about it, I'm, I'm having a difficult time uh, keeping myself composed. But I'll share a couple of uh, recent ones that I personally tweeted about that I thought was pretty funny. There was one where she was telling this really well thought out um, intelligent professor uh, who uh, thinks really critically about the things that he posts. And he ended up asking for a little bit of maturity from her colleague Nathan Rooser, a fully grown 23-year-old think tanky who was completely shooting down a very reasonable request from this professor to be a little bit more mature in his response to when he pointed out some issues with his material. So what Vicky ends up doing is um, seeing Nathan Rooser as some sort of a man-child that she needs to uh, protect is that uh, she accuses the professor of ageism, all while throwing in a remark that this isn't the 1950s anymore. <laughs> I mean, the, the, I, I don't need to explain why that's, uh, that's ridiculous. And this is one of the reasons I think that this, is, this must be a comedy bit, to have somebody who's this deliberately uh, unself-aware. But there was another one of hers that I personally really liked, where she was trying to convince everyone that she was scared for her safety while a, 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 a scary ch a mainland Chinese journalist was taking photos of her. And when she posted the actual video that was attached to this narrative, she says nothing about this person taking photos of her. And instead, she's trying to tell this journalist to go and find another building to take a photo of, as if this is not a public space. And, um, and, and Vicky doesn't sound intimidated at all. On the contrary, she sounds like a, some sort of an irate customer at Walmart asking to see the manager. Uh, I'll let you hear the video for yourself. She's the one behind the camera with the, with the massive attitude. Where are you from? I'm sad he's building. I just uh, take a building photo. I don't think you should take photos of this building. Can you go find another one, please? Go find another building to take. Yeah. So um, she sounds super frightened there, and of this uh, absolutely vicious reporter who she said was super aggressive in some of her comments. Also, that's uh, totally what we saw. Eh? Anyways, moving on. 
I want to quickly uh, talk about Nathan Rooser also before we get to the main story because he's a really interesting little think tanky who I've actually had exchanges with. He was trying to convince me uh, at one point of the quality of Western reporting on Xinjiang. And uh, in specific, uh, the forced sterilization story, he referenced an article which had first-hand testimonies. And he referred to it as a conclusive article. And so what I did was I asked him, I said, do you have any concerns referring to the testimonies in this report as conclusive? And there weren't many testimonies. When one of the, 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 the main testimonies was somebody who completely changed her story within months of her previous interview, and not in a minor way, in a way that completely contradicts the old story. Um, and so I asked him basically if he had a concern with this. His response to that was uh, that he immediately blocked me and went into some sort of a weird uh, think tanky meltdown where he was talking about uh, uh, human rights abuse, deniers, and all kinds of stuff like that. He never addressed the actual concerns with the article which he was calling conclusive. And that's probably uh, expected from somebody like him working for an organization like ASPI. So continuing on with Nathan Rooser, this particular think tanky, he's known as a, a, a satellite imagery expert by the media, and he refers to himself as being proficient in satellite imagery uh, analysis, uh, analysis on uh, Google Maps. But what it basically looks like is he's you know somewhere down in his mom's basement looking at Google Maps yelling out, I think I saw something once in a while. Like, like, no, literally, he finds images of schools with football pitches and says, look, I found a concentration camp where they play football. Or he'll take a, a, a before and after photo of a satellite image within, you know, a few years of each other and um, says, uh, look, it's changed. And, and if, you, if you squint enough, you're like, oh, yeah, I guess there's a few changes. And he says, yes, it's a watchtower. <laughs> And, um, and then he'll go and he'll draw these lines around it and he says, I think this is a fence and all this kind of stuff. Um, it really is spectacular to witness. And, 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 and let me illustrate with you in a far more clear way how hard this guy tries to find something. So he takes a screenshot from a CGTN documentary and he says, look, in the background, that green thing, it's a special code that police can scan and find everything they need to know about this man's business and family because they wouldn't be able to do this otherwise. <laughs> And it's literally a WeChat payment code. Like uh, everybody, even, even people who have never been to China can see this clearly. I, I gotta say, Vicky Xu, if, you know, your, 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 your colleague Nathan here is beating you like crazy on the comedy front here. But seriously guys, jo joking aside, people are eating this stuff up. Like what, what, what the heck is wrong with the public these days? In any other circumstances, someone like Nathan Rooster would be laughed off of Twitter and called an absolute lunatic. But he's saying something that people are desperate to believe. And, and you know, if it wasn't enough that you guys are listening to someone bad-mouthing China who's profiting off of the China threat narrative, you're still going to believe this garbage after something like this? Like, come on, guys. We, we seriously need to wake up here, especially considering what's at stake here with some of the stuff being excused for uh, potentially a future conflict. But let me move on to the main part of my story, and that involves the coming together of two separate topics, somewhat speaking, uh, that I have been talking about on Twitter over the past few days. So the, the first topic was obviously the one that I was talking about with ASPI, and the second was born from my interactions with uh, Lyman Stone. He's the guy who made um, who did a debate with Carl Zai and I made a video about, and he said in that video that you could buy Uyghur slaves off of Taobao. Then he backed out, backtracked, saying that, well, okay, you can go to a business-to-business -business portal site to find a slave for your business. <laughs> and um, so I told him, I said, all right, I'm a business owner here in China. I'd like to purchase a slave through this business-to-business uh, -business portal that you said is easily provable. And what I'd do is I'd vlog about it and uh, it'll, it'll be pretty valuable for his research and ASPI's research also. So he says, sure, here you go. And he simply gives me a link to an ASPI article about it. Um, so that's the first tie-in, but that's not the main tie-in that I'm going to talk about. And uh, what I end up saying is I say, no, 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 uh, you know what? Um, I want the actual link to the portal. 
And I said, you know, for example, if I was a business in America, I know exactly where I'd go to get prison labor. I'd go to Unicor's website. And according to third party investigations, prison laborers are paid anywhere between 14 cents and $1.41 per hour. In reality, there's actually many prison jobs that they're paid nothing for. I'm not sure if that's part of Unicor's program or not, but that's besides the point. I will post a link to somebody named Jessica Kent in one of her videos where she talks about her own personal experiences going through uh, the prison labor uh, system in the US. She was uh, incarcerated, I think for a number of years, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and she vlogs about her experiences in prison and coming out. Um, so you can hear firsthand from her about those labor programs. Uh, but after this, after asking for the actual portal, Lyman Stone um, perhaps inevitably blocked me uh, because he was unable to provide that link and it must have been pretty um, uh, humiliating for him to say something like this, say it's easily provable, you can go online now and he can't even provide the link to me when I'm ready to actually uh, follow through with it and, and, and vlog about the process. So what I did was I took the foundation of that interaction and I retweeted it. And I uh, started with sharing a video from Unicorn with a, with a, it had really cheesy elevator music in the background. And I used the caption, America, sanctioning companies and factories in Xinjiang over suspected unproven slave labor so that they can bring jobs back to their fully confirmed domestic slave labor re-education camps. Now in that video, they actually specifically talk about retraining these prisoners. And they also, in a separate part, talk about bringing jobs back to the US. I think they use the word reshoring, uh, you know, uh, US, uh, uh, manufacturing jobs or something like that. So with joking aside, my tweet and the way that I represented it was actually pretty accurate. Thereafter, on the second tweet underneath that, in this two-part uh, uh, thread, what was the two-part thread at that point, I said, of course, not every part of the system wants to see good American slave laborers graduate from their re-education camps. And this particular video that I'm talking about and that I tweeted together with this um, is too good to share. So I will share that with you now. I don't know anything about rehabbing a prisoner. They're releasing some good ones that we use every day to, to wash cars, to change the oil in our cars, to cook in the kitchen to do all that where we save money, well, they're going to let them out. Let's face it, somebody got to be number one. Okay, that isn't why I got elected. I got elected to arrest the guy or girl. All right, so after uh, posting this, quite a few people added a lot of additional really valuable information over the past few days, like mentioning that it's literally written into the Constitution that prison slave labor is okay. In the 13th Amendment, what it says about abolishing slavery and slavery not being legal is neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime for which the person has been duly convicted. So basically it's in black and white that prison labor is okay in the US. There's of course far more troubling things than just this, um, you know, where, uh, for example, when California was basically all shut down because of the uh, COVID-19, because of the coronavirus pandemic, people in the uh, slave labor, prison factories, whatever you want to call them, they were still going to work and they were still doing their jobs for pennies on the hour. Um, so these people, I mean, they're, they're treated like absolute animals, but, but whatever, who cares, right? This is what US think tanks and think tankies do. They accuse other countries of doing what they're actually doing, even, they don't, even though they don't have evidence to back up their accusations. And uh, it acts as a pretty awesome distraction because afterwards, when you point the finger back at them and say, well, well, well hold on a second, this isn't proven, but you are actually doing the things that you're pretending to be outraged about. They just yell back, what about ism? That's not what we're talking about right now. So it works really well. And um, so, you know, hats off to them. Good, good strategy there. But let's pull this back in. What does this have to do with the original ASPI uh, interactions specifically? And how do these stories tie together in a more meaningful way than simply uh, the part when um, uh, Lyman used their report as evidence of slave labor? Well, you're going uh, to have to brace yourself for this one, guys. You're going to have to get ready for this one. <laughs> ASPI 
who pushes the China threat story, then sells military equipment to counteract that China threat, which is sufficiently ironic on its own, pushes a China slave labor story as part of that effort, while the military equipment manufacturers they represent have their equipment made by, you guessed it, <laughs> slave labor. We have uh, BAE Systems, uh, who use prison labor for components in their military vehicles. We have Boeing that uses prison labor for components in their uh, F-15 fighter jets. We have Cisco Systems, which uh, uses prisoner labor for their call centers. We have uh, KBR, which has lawsuits open on them for human trafficking and a $180 million bribery case. We have Lockheed Martin using prison labor for parts in their F-16 jets and Patriot missiles. We have Microsoft, who's also using slave uh, prison labor for their marketing call centers. Uh, Raytheon, same thing, uh, prison labor for components in their Patriot missiles. Um, uh, Circle Group, they use uh, immigration detainee labor. Now those are pictures, those are camps we have pictures of, uh, which are quite interesting also. Uh, we have um, the UAE government. Now this is more of a general uh, problematic thing because uh, obviously they have some pretty uh, serious human rights issues while funding a, um, a think tank who is uh, basically shifting the focus over to China. Uh, you have uh, Unisys, uh, so they are they're a provider of U.S. prison phone systems. So it doesn't necessarily say, this report doesn't necessarily say those were made by slave labor. But it's still an interesting point to mention because there are, uh, there are suppliers in China, there are uh, factories in China who uh, allegedly supply alleged concentration camps and they are sanctioned by the U.S. government. But here you have um, one of ASPI's uh, donors who is a provider of systems for uh, these prisons which are using something close to slave labor in the US. And then of course the US government itself, who is the owner of the largest uh, US prison labor company, uh, which should be, I think it's, uh, I think that is the Unicor one, uh, but regardless, they are basically the, the whole issue behind this entire thing. So that's it. I, uh, I think I'm just going to leave it here for you guys to kind of let that settle in. Um, this isn't something that anybody could even possibly imagine making up. Um, and that's why I say, you know, if Vicky Shu is really on a comedy reconnaissance mission, then she's actually an absolute genius. But if she's not, and she's really just um, as unethical and full of uh, BS as her uh, fellow think tankies, then... Um, that's the sad state of uh, some of the people we have in this world convincing you um, to hate other countries. Um, so as I said, I'm gonna wrap it up here. Um, my next video, I think if everything goes well and if my guest shows up, is going to be with somebody who I made an accusation against before that they were involved with the, with the US military programs. Turns out it's true. However, they reached out to me to give me a little bit more context. And I think it's a valuable context uh, for people to take a couple of steps back because a lot of people have been giving this person a hard time about it. Um, and as I said, even though it is problematic, um, there is a, a very valuable piece to the story that I, uh, I think should be mentioned. So if this person, um, uh, if nothing happens, that will be my next interview, fingers crossed. So with that said, I'm going to wrap it up here and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.